Greetings. I'm speaking to you from Central Florida. It's a pretty hot place. When we turn on the sprinkler, all we get is vapor. No, I'm kidding. It's not that bad. Uh, and I really enjoy living in Florida. And um, I would invite you to, when God willing, when this pandemic uh, settles out, as I hope and pray that it will speedily, uh, maybe a lot of you can come on down here and help build a, uh, a congregation here. Maybe someday a mega church. But today I want to talk about the history of God's church. This talk today is about the message marches into Macedonia. The message marches into Macedonia. Uh, here we come to Acts, the 16th chapter, the 8th verse, as Paul uh, and Silas are probably Luke with them, of course, he's writing. And uh, it says, so pass in verse 8, so in passing by Mycia, they came to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. So something very dramatic is about to happen in the history of the church. Now, God told the people of Israel, and then, of course, what was left of the people of Israel, the nation of Judah, his Old Testament church, that he would be with them, that they would not be consumed. You know, it's like the, the burning bush. You know, the bush burns, but it is not consumed. If you go to the book of Malachi, the third chapter, and the sixth verse, Malachi 3, 6. For I am the eternal, I do not change. Remember what the book of Hebrews says about Jesus Christ. Verse 13, 8, the same yesterday, today, and forever. For I am the eternal, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. The people of Israel remain in existence. The old covenant community exists to this day. And God has promised to be with his church. You know the uh, verse, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that's quoted in Hebrews 12. I want to go to Matthew 16, where Jesus Christ talks about raising up his church. He came here to raise up a new covenant church. Uh, verse uh, 19. Well, I'll go to verse 18. That's where he talks to Peter. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and he play, he, it's a play on his name. He gave him the name, Kepha, or, or in, uh, you know, in Aramaic, or Petros in Greek. And I, I also say to you that you are Peter, and, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So the church is not going to die. So through history, the church has had its ups and downs, of course. Uh, but uh, we're talking in the book of Acts about the exciting early years of the church when it was growing exponentially. And this is an important phase in its history. God's sacred calendar is based on a 19-year time cycle. I believe the astronomers call it the Metonic cycle. And if you look at the history of the New Testament church, it seems that, uh, that the first 76 years, 19 times 4, we're going in a cyclical pattern from 31, from A.D. 31 uh, to A.D. Uh, 108, I guess it is, right? Or 107, I'm sorry, 76 years. From A.D. 31 to A.D. 107, 76-year period. And uh, I think you'll see that in modern times, uh, there was a, a work of God that began uh, very humbly uh, with a small group of Christian commandment keepers, a small congregation in Northwest United States with 19 members in 1934. And it went through a, a period of four time, 19 year time cycles uh, towards the uh, end of the, uh, towards the, the, uh, towards the uh, third part of that cycle, it began to, to uh, really build in, in numbers where, where there were from the 19 uh, that began, 
it was now 144,000 men, women, and children who would come together at 100 different festival sites during the Festival of Tabernacles and the Eighth Day of Sacred Assembly. But then, uh, I don't want to go into the history of it, but we find that work came to an end officially uh, on 20, in 2010. It went from 1934 to, to 2010, a 76-year period. Well, I, you know, you could argue about that one way or the other, but that just does seem to be what's happening here in Acts 16. Here we have 50 AD, the church had begun in, in 31, and then uh, 19 years later, in 50, the church goes into Europe, uh, from Asia to Europe, from uh, Turkey into Greece. Uh, verse 9, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia, stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now I want, I want you to be very careful about people who must make such claims today, uh, because th this is the Apostle Paul. These are people taught personally by Jesus Christ who are responsible for the canonized scripture that has been studied for uh, centuries and centuries since. So, you know, one can understand that God's in very special ways communicated with them. We want to be very cautious about people who make such claims now. And uh, I'm not saying that, that God couldn't communicate with, with, with someone, and if that person wants to share it, but, if, but, but what I'm con concerned about is a minister getting up in front of a large crowd and talking about some vision that, 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 that he has seen or dream he's had and telling this whole huge crowd about it and making a, a major uh, deal, a major uh, uh, event about it. I would be very, very cautious. But anyway, th we do find that the Apostle Paul, and you know, responsible for so much in the New Testament, that God did choose to do that for him. And it was a man of Macedonia who stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to uh, Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi. Now, my children, my family, would be very happy to know that uh, Alexander the Great, when he was only 20, became the ruler of Macedonia. He was the uh, son of Philip II. Um, and Philip II uh, had renamed this city uh, Philippi after him. And uh, later on, much long after Alexander the Great, uh, this city became a Roman colony, uh, a place for veterans of the Roman army to settle. So I presume a lot of the people there uh, were Latin speaking, but it was located in in Greece, and so overall was a, a Greek speaking area. And the epistle that Paul wrote to the Philippians later on, to the church in Philippi, was written in Greek. At least that's the copy that you know we have that's been preserved over the centuries in the Greek speaking world. It was written in Greek. Uh, so anyway, we have this city, which, as I said, had been a, we had become a Roman colony located in the northern part of Greece. So here they go to this major center now. And from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. Now comes the Sabbath. And Paul kept the Sabbath. The early church kept the Sabbath. And, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, it's interesting, uh, it may be that there were men praying too, and the Jewish practice was to pray separately, men praying and women praying separately. Uh, for some reason, they, they were drawn to, 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 to the women. Uh, maybe it, it was only a women's meeting at that time. Uh, and it would seem that uh, the women were what we would call in those days God-fearers, they weren't necessarily Jews uh, or, or converts to Judaism, but they were uh, women who were in the frame of mind of wanting to seek out 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob wanting to live according to the Torah. And maybe some of them were converts to Judaism. Maybe some of them were Jews. But this is basically a Gentile city. And so we have, as we understand from Acts 15, now the gospel is going in a very explosive way to the Gentile world. And this is a, a part of that, expanding into Europe, which was not a, you know, where there were Jewish communities, there were some there, but it was overwhelmingly, of course, you know, we're, we're talking about overwhelmingly Gentile areas uh, here. Although when we begin, we begin with the Jews because they have the background, you know, to understand, uh, you know, and, and to become a, a kind of nucleus, a core for then a larger congregation. So this was the Sabbath. There were people worshiping on the Sabbath and the group of women. Now, when, when God pictures the church in the Bible, the church is pictured as a woman. And I think you will find that uh, often uh, beginnings of the church uh, begin with a, with a female figure. And here we have Lydia. And evidently that's because she came from that area uh, of Lydia. So she, she it's like, you know, somebody maybe is called Tex uh, or Tennessee or so forth. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. So she perhaps had a background uh, in in uh, the Bible and uh, Paul ex explained her explained to her really the whole the whole picture, the whole message, the whole theme of the Bible. And so she came to an appreciation of of the role of Jesus Christ in God's plan of salvation. And God was calling her through the Apostle Paul. He was opening her, her mind. As it says here, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. It's interesting that she was she dealt with uh, with purple, purple dye. It may be that, that she also dealt with the dye that would have been used in the in the fringes uh, that uh, for the um, tassels that uh, Orthodox Jewish men would have been wearing in those days. Uh, it's also possible that if she dealt with dye, that she also dealt with textiles. And I think the way I th <clears throat> one reason that that is interesting to me is that uh, if you look in the Book of Revelation, the second chapter, you'll see that there were the fourth church uh, in the seven churches that are mentioned in Revelation is the church in Thyatira, and prophetically, that uh, would refer, I believe, to a fourth era of the church, uh, the medieval church, and uh, we, which which which, uh, we, which we find in the community of the Waldensians. And if I think if you study the history of the of the Waldensians, you find an association with weavers. Uh, you find that church associated with with the occupation of weaver. And I think it's interesting. Here we have Lydia from Thyatira, and and she is the one who specializes in the selling of purple dye. I just think that's interesting. So she may have dealt with textiles and may have been a kind of precursor to the to the church in Thyatira and even to the uh, prophetic church of Thyatira, the, the, uh, those who, those Waldensians who would, would be part of the, of the uh, commandment-keeping Christian movement. Anyway, let's continue. I hope I haven't said too much and gotten you off track here. So let's go back to the account. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized. So this is interesting. She, she, she was a woman of substance. You know, a Proverbs 31 type woman. If you, you, know, if you read uh, that, 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 those verses, she seemed to be that, sort, that kind of woman. And so one, one could speculate that she was a widow that that you know that she she uh, had inherited perhaps a household um you know and because in those days to, um, you know it wouldn't have been that easy for a woman to 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 be quite in the position we see here on her own without a man so i it's possible she was a widow anyway now a certain woman named lydia heard us she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. So she, her, so the, the household was converted. So now we have the beginning of a church. 
and uh, presumably when we see the, the household, there would have been males as well, you know, perhaps uh, children and so on. Uh, and when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. And you find other examples like that in the Bible uh, of, of uh, hospitable women serving uh, God's uh, messengers. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. So there is an occult. There is a, uh, there, is a, a demon there are demonic forces in the world and we need to keep away from them. Uh, let's not get fascinated by them. Let's keep away. Let's keep away. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But here was, here was uh, somebody involved in, 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 in occult practices, and evidently there was some power there. She was making a uh, profit for, uh, for her masters, it says here. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. So some of these, remember that uh, these spirits are, are irrational, they're insane, but some things they say are, are, are correct for what you know for whatever reason uh you know there i don't want to get into into all of that but but you know the, the bottom line is that that this community of of fallen spirits fallen angels is irrational uh, but sometimes what they'll what they'll say correct things 18 and this she did for many days she, and so she was making a nuisance of herself. She was saying the truth, but she probably wasn't really helping them by, by, by doing this. Uh, and, you know, and, and this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he had that power. The name of Jesus Christ is all-powerful. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. But, but when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, so they, they, they knew that somehow this woman no longer had the power that she had before. She, she was different. She was back being a normal person, not just uh, spewing out, you know, and, and being, uh, you know, showing obvious signs of, of uh, you know, not being her, a normal person. Now, now she was back to being a normal, a normal woman. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. So I suppose they did so out of vengeance, out of, you know, upset. But they may have also thought, maybe if we can get rid of them, this power can come back to her, you know, because they were exploiting her. Now, I, I, it wasn't making her, it wasn't good for her, but, it, you know, it was profitable for them. Anyway, and, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. Well, now, the, the, the authorities there weren't necessarily, you know, pro, pro-Jewish, pro but they did want stability. They didn't want peace and order. They were very loyal to Rome. And here they're accused in verse 21. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. Now, the Romans did allow the Jews uh, leeway, to be very different from others in the empire, but they didn't want the Jews, uh, you know, disrupting the normal, you know, Roman traditions. Um, so, and this was what they accused them of. Then the multitude rose up together against them. So, you know, what you find here is maybe what you might call anti-Semitism, which, you know, seems to be a perpetual problem in the world. Then the multitude rose up uh, together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Well, that was a very harsh period, and and uh, you know if if you read about it, uh, and and so without really, it seems like a tremendous amount of evidence. Uh, you know the the crowd gathered, and and um, and the, I guess the magistrate decided to pacify the crowd, you know, and go along with 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 with, with punishing them. They seemed to be troublemakers. The crowd was evidently moved by these people that, you know, accused them to, to go along with it and to consider them disruptive. Uh, and maybe there were some things they said that did, you know, uh, did seem to be, con you know, contradict the Roman approach to life. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. 
And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. So what tremendous courage they had, you know, um, what tremendous courage Paul and Silas had. Uh, Silas may be another name for Silvanus, who you, you, and you can read about him in uh, other parts of the Bible. He co-authored uh, some epistles. He's mentioned in, in Peter's writings, if it's the same person. Uh, there's scholars argue about uh, the Silas here, but I just wanted to mention uh, the possibility of his being Silvanus. That's uh, a possibility. Anyway, having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So very harsh treatment and over, over much, really. Uh, and uh, they got their comeuppance as a result. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Could you imagine what, you know, what their attitude? Uh, again, you have to admire their courage. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and their, and their prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there, in verse 20, there was a great, 26, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And evidently, however, they, they were sort of disoriented, didn't know what to do, and uh, didn't immediately rush for the exit. Uh, maybe they just felt like they didn't want to take their chances uh, of, of, of escaping and then being caught and, and having a worse fate. you know. But anyway, although they, some of them could have escaped, evidently they didn't at that point. But you could understand the warden would have been terrified at such a thing. You know, It would mean his life. So in verse 27, And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. So he'd rather kill himself than have to suffer through what they would have done to him and perhaps his family. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Uh, then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So maybe he'd been here overhearing those hymns as well. So first you had Lydia and her household and the, the devout women there, Sabbath-keeping women. Now you have this warden, this keeper of the prison, uh, and um, he, is, he is moved. So God used this sign to move that warden, that keeper of the prison. Um, so we go to verse 31. So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Well, if we, you know, we have to, if to believe on him, we have to have some concept of, you know, who he is, what he taught, etc. Who is he? And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. So once again, we have a, a, a house, a, 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 in the first case, we had a matriarchal figure to begin. Now we have a patriarchal figure. So he and his household are influenced. Uh, then he spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, you know, so he treated them kindly. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. So he stuck his neck out doing that. Now when he had brought them into the house, he set food before them and he rejo into his, so now they were not in prison at, at that moment, but in his house. He set food before them and he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. So the church is really developing there. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the officer saying, let that, those, those men go. You know, so that was enough. Uh, you know, they really didn't really have that much on them, you could say, and that was enough. But now they're going to have to pay for their being so overbearing and so cruel and so unfair, as you'll see in a moment. So the keeper of the prison reported, reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul took advantage of the fact that he was a Roman citizen, and evidently Silas as well. Now evidently in those days there was a, a certificate that you could, you could maybe fold up and carry as kind of a charm that, you know, like you'd wear on, uh, around your wrist, around your neck, maybe around your ankle. And you could take it out and, and you know, and, and show it. And, and evidently you could prove your Roman citizenship that way. That was, I think, how, how perhaps Paul did it. 
So, uh, you know, something that you could carry on your person. Um, uh, so here's what Paul says. You know, as John Kennedy said many years later in a very famous speech he gave in Berlin, he said, at the time of the Apostle Paul, you know, the greatest thing you could say is, I'm a citizen of Rome. And then so he said in, in German, or he tried to say in German, I am a Berliner, you know, and, 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 as analogous to I am a Roman citizen at the time of Paul. Maybe you remember that, uh, that speech that John F. Kennedy gave way back when. But anyway... But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison. <coughs> Pardon me, and now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. You know, so he, he this was important for these people to learn that lesson, how to behave themselves, and how to behave themselves towards, you know, towards this Christian movement that was developing. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. You know, they didn't want to have any further complications. You know, but the, but the, the work had been done. A church had been established. Two households now uh, and more, you know, were now a part of the of the. Uh, of the church at Philippi, which grew, and as you, as you see later, there's the epistle written to the church. Verse 40, so they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. So now they're back there with the, with the original group, you know, with the original uh, uh, woman. Uh, and when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So by now there's a church, and they encouraged the church, and then they moved on to Athens, uh, actually to, uh, to Salonika. Uh, Thessalonica, the, the the next stop. Uh, now they're going further down into into Greece from the north from Macedonia. They're going down, but now we have the church established in Philippi. <coughs> so what we see here is God moving very powerfully with miracles to to give the church a jump start to get it going, uh, and at the same time too we see that He allows uh, challenges to you know to the leadership. Of course, the Apostle Paul had had persecuted very, uh, very violently. Initially, the, the, the early Christians there in, in the land of Israel. So he felt like, okay, I, I, I dished it out. Now I have to take it. And uh, so he, he was one who, who did had to have to suffer greatly. But, you know, he is a great hero uh, of, uh, of God's church. And he and Silas both suffered here. But at the same time, uh, they, they were released uh, and they were released, you know, they left, you could say, with a high hand in a way, as is not necessarily with wealth, but at least they left having put fear into the leadership there. And they left also knowing that a church had been, a solid, a stable uh, church had been established there. And later on, we see, as I said, the epistle written to that church. And I want to go to that, uh, to that epistle, uh, written to the Philippians. Now, it's not written to the Philippines. Uh, you know, there are a lot of nice, wonderful Christians in the Philippines, but I'm talking about Phil Philippi in, Gre in Macedonia. Anyway, so we go to the fourth chapter uh, of the book of Philippians. And one thing he wrote to that church, I would like to uh, leave you with today on the Sabbath uh, during this uh, summer season, which I'm talking. Uh, this is important for us to keep our, our perspective and our sanity and, and a proper attitude. It actually affects your health. Your mental health affects your, your physical health. Your emotions affect your, you know, your, your, uh, how, how you are bodily. That, that I think anybody would agree with that. And so in, in 4.8 of Philippians, Paul says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, you know, I think that we're going to come up with, uh, with, with uh, seven things, right? Whatever things are, are noble, let's go, that's number one. Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there is any virtue, number six, and if there's anything praiseworthy, so complete, you know, seven points. Meditate on these things. Yes, I understand we need to keep up with events. We need to know what's going on. But at the same time, you know, look into God's word and, and look into how, look into what God promises ultimately 
is the reward of, of, this, of, of, of those who have been selected to be in his church, and ultimately, what is the future of humankind in general? Keep these things in mind, especially from Sabbath to Sabbath. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That's what he told that church in Philippi. The Philippian letter overall is a very positive one, if you read it. A very upbeat kind of an epistle. And at the uh, conclusion of the epistle, he says in verse 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Indeed, amen. All the best to you and yours.